People typically think of the eye as being like a camera and that the retina is just the film in the back of it. And so you're taking images and then the brain does all of the hard part. But it's not really true. The retina is actually a little mini image processor. So it pulls out features from the visual world and it sends those up to the brain. And it's sort of like the building blocks for everything that you do. It pulls out features that you need for recognizing faces, for telling if somebody's attractive to you, to maneuver through the visual environment and not crash into stuff. What people knew before I was doing this is that information in, in, in the retina, in, everywhere in your brain, is represented in neural electrical activity. But what does that electrical activity mean? How, you know, you see these patterns of pulses. It looks like Morse code, you know, pulse, 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 pulse. But what does it mean? Just like DNA with these strings of AGTC, and, and what, what does it mean? So that's what I did, is to understand how does an image get represented in those patterns of pulses? So you could go either way. I could see the pattern of pulses and know what you were seeing. Or I could see an image and send those pattern of pulses into your brain if I wanted to uh, treat blindness. People had worked on trying to understand the relationship before me, but they did it with very simple images like stripes or sine wave gratings. But it didn't work when you had natural scenes, when you had you know, trees and people and babies and, and real life. And so what I did was understand the, the mathematics of making it generalized so that it, so that it worked for everything. So it wasn't just a lab experiment, it was a real life, true encoder. The epiphany moment wasn't so much on, on I, I knew how to do it. I, it occurred to me how to, how to do it. Um, and it, where the eureka moment was, was after I did it, and I realized if I have this, I have the potential to make blind people see. And then, you know, like three weeks later, if I have this, I have the potential to make robots see. And, and so suddenly I wasn't a basic scientist, but I was an, an applied scientist. And so that was, you know, that whole tran transition. And that led me to have to become an entrepreneur. So I built two companies. One's called Bionic Sight, and that's to make the treatment for blind people. And then in parallel, I started a separate company in computer vision. The computer vision company was sold recently to, to Intel, because Intel is so much bigger than I am, and it has so many uses so that they can develop it. Like one of the things they're using it for is for NASA, for you know, making robots on Mars that can navigate through weird environments and not crash into each other. Also for guiding surgery, for there's of course self-driving cars detecting shoplifting, detecting emotions, and I couldn't really do all of that. So I have a wonderful partner in that way. And then I can switch my time over to focus on helping blind people because this is the mission of our medical school and it's more relevant to, to who I am as a professor. With respect to what, what it looks like for a patient, you know, what the treatment is, is they get a, an injection of, of gene therapy, it's an optogenetic gene therapy that is, interacts with the device. And the device is the part that has the neural code in it. And so they wear sort of like goggles. Right now they're sort of big and clunky, but soon they will be hopefully cool goggles like Geordi on, on Star Trek. That's what I, we always say. And so far we've done nine patients and it's going well. Every patient has seen some level of improvement. We've only done the lower doses so far, so we're working our way up to the higher doses. The patients can see light, so we know that the gene therapy is getting in. They can see motion, they can see the direction of motion, and a little more than that, but I'm not allowed to talk about it because of <laughs> FDA rules. But we're excited. A key part of this also is not being afraid of failure. So if I have an idea, I may be secretly in love with my own idea, right? And then I test it and I'm wrong. You know, you're depressed for a little while, you eat a quart of ice cream, whatever. But then you realize, it, you, you test it enough times to be sure that you're wrong. Once you're sure you're wrong, then it becomes a very important fact, a constraint on your hypothesis. And then invariably, it leads me to the right path. But if you fight it, and you're just sort of, oh, that's just an outlier, I'll just sweep it under the rug. You'll never get there. My father was very much like this. My mother was a really great poet, not a famous poet, but she was a perfectionist, and I think it was a burden for her, even though she's a wonderfully talented person. I'm, much, I'm more like my father in the sense that he would, he would screw up sometimes, but he learned from his mistakes. That's what I want to encourage women or ever, anybody to do. Don't be afraid of failure, but pay attention to your failures. They mean something. I don't really think about all of like the glory aspects of it. It's more because there's so much work involved. <laughs> so it's just day to day, trying to keep you know the blinders on, just focus, and not daydream about <laughs> the big picture at the end, but just paying attention to the patients. The patients are your partners, and so this is, goes back to what I was saying before about you know you have your hypothesis, and you think the patient will see something, and then they say something different from what you thought, and you know you listen.